in our sixth and final installment of chapter four, we're looking at 4.5, quantitative chemical analysis, which is really just taking all the ideas from chapter four and tying them together, I'm figuring out how they're actually used in the lab. Okay. So what is quantitative analysis? The determination of the amount or concentration of a substance within a sample. Okay. There are two main types, arguably three here, that are introduced in 4.5, titration and gravimetric analysis that are listed here, as well as a combustion analysis that's also covered in 4.5. We'll talk about each of them in turn. First one, titration. Okay. This, I'll jump forward and then come back. Okay, this is what a titration looks like. Maybe you've run one in the past, maybe not. You certainly will later on this semester if you haven't already. Okay, you've got a burette at the top, typically attached to a ring stand, right? We'll stopper here to control the flow. And that goes into a solution of an unknown concentration at the bottom. Okay, typically contained in an Erlenmeyer flask. You swirl it around and look for a color change. So we've got two things here. Right. Our titrant, that was the thing on top shown in blue, solution with a known concentration, right, typically in molarity, of one reactant. And that reacts with the analyte, right, which is of an unknown concentration. If we measure how much of the titrant from the top was used to completely react with the analyte in the bottom, right, that allows us to calculate that concentration of the analyte by determining the equivalence point. Right, when they've completely reacted with one another. But in order to determine that equivalence point, right, it's impossible without viewing at the molecular scale. Okay? So what we use is an endpoint provided by an indicator. Okay? The endpoint is when we stop the titration. That's how much volume of the titrant we've actually added to react with the analyte. And what the indicator does right, is it does something like a color change to tell us when the reaction is over. They fully reacted with one another. Right? So it allows us to visually determine that. The most common indicator is phenolphthalein, which changes from colorless to pink or pink to colorless, depending on if you're titrating with an acid or a base. If you're doing a good titration, the difference between the equivalence and the endpoint should be negligible. You're trying to stop it right at the equivalence point. So here in example 4.14, right, we're given an example of how a titration problem might appear, an acid-base titration. Okay. We're given 50 milliliters of aqueous HCl, and that reacted by adding, right, it reached the equivalence, the endpoint, by adding 35.23 milliliters of 0.25 molar sodium hydroxide. We're given the reaction. First thing we do, make sure the reaction is balanced, which it is, right? Check the atoms on each side. And then we're asked to calculate the molarity of the HCl. Yep. So what's the approach here? I have to compare moles in stoichiometry as we got from 4.3. So I use the volume, 35.23, and molarity, 0.25, of the sodium hydroxide to find how many moles reacted. Right? That's from chapter three in molarity type calculation. Then I use stoichiometry to compare that to number of moles of HCl, which is a one-to-one -one ratio in this situation. And then if I know moles of HCl and 50 milliliters, I can use those two numbers to solve for the molarity of the HCl. So I recommend you pause the video and try that. The next two slides talk to you about the strategy, show the calculation for finding moles, and then for solving for molarity keeping in mind that the volumes were provided in milliliters, and you must first convert them to liters. So that's analysis method number one. What's number two? How about a gravimetric analysis? What is a gravimetric analysis? We take something in a sample and undergo a physical change. Typically, you're precipitating it out. So we just saw an acid-base reaction from chapter four. Here's a precipitation reaction from chapter four. Then if you precipitate something out, you can measure it because it's a solid. You can take the mass, F, then use the formula mass to find how many moles you have, and then do stoichiometry to figure out what's in the solution. Yep. And you use filtration 
to get a solid precipitate out of an aqueous solution. So here's an example of what that might look like in a word problem. Given 0.455 solid mixture that has some magnesium sulfate in it. If we don't know how much, we just know it's a mixture, it's got some magnesium sulfate. You can take that and treat it with barium nitrate. And when you have magnesium sulfate and barium nitrate together, right, they'll react and produce barium sulfate and magnesium nitrate. And when you do that reaction, in this case, it produced 0.6168 grams of barium sulfate. So given that information, we're asked to solve for the mass percent of magnesium sulfate. Again, I recommend you pause the video and try this. Good practice for chapter three and four ideas wrapped up in one problem. What's the strategy? I, well, this is a mixture, so I don't know what to do with that. I take the only other number I have, 0.6168 grams of barium sulfate. Convert from grams to moles. Remember, we're always wanting to deal with moles in this situation. Uh, so 0.6168, I can convert that to moles of barium sulfate by dividing by the formula mass. Then I use stoichiometry. Right? It's a one-to-one -one ratio between barium sulfate and magnesium sulfate. And so I can find moles of magnesium sulfate. Then use the formula mass of magnesium sulfate to convert that from moles to grams of magnesium sulfate. Then that final answer in grams divided by the 0.455 grams of the mixture times 100 gives you your mass percent, which is shown in slide 118 and 119. That was method number two, gravimetric analysis. We finish with combustion analysis. Combustion analysis is useful because it allows us to, to, to determine the composition of hydrocarbons and similar compounds right, by combusting them reacting them with oxygen to produce CO2 and H2O. Right? And then we can determine those quantities as well, right? if it's a complete combustion. This is what that looks like. Right? Then you absorb the CO2, you absorb the H2O, figure out the mass difference, right? how much mass is added. So we're given the grams of H2O or grams of CO2, and then we're in business. We can use those to figure out the original masses of the hydrocarbons. So here's what this one might look like. Right? This is a lengthy problem because we're taking it all the way to an empirical formula. Okay? We're given a polymer right, and a combustion analysis of 0 0.00126 grams of polyethylene gives us 0 0.00394 grams of CO2 and 0 0.00161 grams of H2O figure out the moles of those, CO2 and H2O, using the formula mass, figuring out the simplest ratio of carbon to hydrogen, and then you're given your empirical formula. Okay. Strategy shown on slide 124, answer on 125. Right. Simple molecular formula of CH2. So those are three perfect examples that tie together multiple concepts from chapter three and chapter four. There's nothing really new in 4.5. Okay? You're asked to know what a titration is, know what a gravimetric analysis is, know what a combustion analysis is. That only takes about 30 seconds to commit those. Uh, the real value in 4.5 is taking the time, working through these examples, making sure you understand where the answers come from because these word problems, which there's one each for the three different methods, show you right, what that analysis type is, and then multiple concepts being tied together. Stoichiometry from chapter four, right, and other mole type conversions from chapter three, and empirical formulas from chapter three as well. Make sure you're familiar with those uh, and the rest of the ideas from the chapters overall. To summarize chapter four, you have balancing by inspection, you have classifying reactions, there's three types, acid base, precipitation, and redox. You have knowing oxidation numbers. You have balancing redox reactions by the half reaction method. Stoichiometry, of which there were just some examples here. Reaction yields, knowing a limiting reactant versus an excess reactant, how to calculate a theoretical yield and a 
percent yield. And then finally, what was covered just in this video. Okay? But know how to do all these different types of examples. This is what will be the focus of your second exam.